Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here as a moderator to try to lead or try to control this team of stars that we reunited here, representing the most different stakeholders of football, the clubs, agents, players, confederations, associations, in order to discuss the good governance, how to develop, how to develop a sustainable growth of the, the sport in Asia. So you're gonna learn, you're gonna hear from these experts, pragmatic, practical perspectives and ideas about the tools that we have at our disposal and also the problematic that we can face in some topics. So without any further delay, since we are a little bit late, uh, I would like to, first of all, introduce my colleagues here, my fellow friends, uh, Mark uh, Stuckliff, Sutcliffe, Hong Kong FA Chief Executive Officer. I'd like to introduce James Kitchen from Kitchen Sports, former head of sports law of the AFC, the uh, Asian Football Confederation. <coughs> then we have Nick DeMarco, Key C from Blackstone Chambers, Barrister. And we have Daniel Lawrence, former head of legal of Porto FC, cast arbitrator and also the agent of the player Hook that is currently here playing in Shanghai. So let's begin with finances, which is also a sensitive point. And I'd like to hear from, from Nick first, if I may. Uh, Nick, we know that we are facing, uh, it's usual to face some default in regards to the payment of what's agreed between players and clubs and between clubs and clubs in case of transfers. Do you think that it's usually lack of money that brings this reality or a lack of the complete understanding of the rules and the consequences of not complying with these financial duties? Well, I think it's both, but it's not so much a lack of money. I think the biggest problem in, in football, um, and this is as true in England, um, perhaps not with one or two of the Premier League clubs, but with Premier League, some Premier League clubs, championship clubs, as it is, I'm sure, in China, is that whereas the money might be there, you may have backers with sufficient backing, ultimately, cash flow is the problem. Um, it, it's a problem of coming up with those regular large wages every month or every week in particular periods. A and football clubs, their, their major expenditure is the players by far, and when cash flow is a problem, the combination of that and uh, not enough knowledge of the consequences, the second point you make, is the real problem. Um, I, I'm in, I've been involved in one and I'm currently involved in two ongoing cases against Chinese clubs for international players who are bringing claims for unpaid wages. It's a big issue in China, as I'm sure people know. And the, the problem for the Chinese clubs is if they don't pay particularly if they don't pay after a period of, say, three months in, especially, then not only will a player be able to walk out, but that player will almost certainly be entitled to be paid the rest of their salary. So the club pays but doesn't get the, the player's service. And also, if they bring a claim to CAS, uh, they, the club may face uh, sporting sanctions, a transfer ban, and so on. So it would be a lot better for the clubs to pay on time and if they if they think beforehand they're gonna have problems paying on time to make sure when they enter a contract with a player they don't bind themselves to something they're unable to perform. Danny what do you think they're short of money in some cases or is not understanding the consequences of, well, of this default? Yeah. Yeah. I can speak a little bit about my experience for 16 years in, in FC Porto Football Club and also what have I seen in the European football scene. And I tend to agree with my colleague here, it's both, but I, I agree that it's more uh, sensibility. And the philosophy, you have to understand, if you're running a club, you're living to win the championship that precise year. You have the pressure of, of the media, you have the pressure of your supporters, and you will do anything to prepare the team to be best prepared to win that year. So it's easy to go over expenditure to, to have the best team and to win. And you don't really care about the second and the third year. So, I mean, if you look 
uh, to the clubs, it's a relatively recent thing, the good governance. I mean, we see it about 15, f the last 15 years, talking more about it. Even the regulatory bodies are tackling it just very recently. And one of the biggest tools that, that recently also came into action was the financial fair play in Europe. But you, you have it in Europe and you just have it for the, for the clubs that compete in the, in the UEFA competitions. So you have many, many clubs that are out of this scope, even with the licensing system of their own countries. Just to give you a small example, there was recently talk about an Italian club, first league club, that had over 100 players on loan. <laughs> so it's, it's really a lot of, uh, a, huge, uh, a huge salary uh, pay sheet that you have. And y if you don't comply with good governance rules, then there's a, a huge amount of consequences that, that will, will drive into you, to your club. And, but thank God we have now a lot of instruments we can go and, uh, and talk about them, like you know the, the, the league licensing, uh, when it comes to transparency, the transfer matching system, and then the financial fair play, which is not only about, uh, about a healthy competition between clubs, but it's also to make clubs more sustainable and prevent them from going bankrupt of, as you pointed out in your question, mm -hmm. over expenditure with, with players, because normally it's about the salaries of the players and the transfer fees. Okay, James, taking advantage of your experience as the legal head of the AFC and one of the responsible, if, if not the main responsible by that time for the implementation and begin to work with the club licensing in the AFC. Uh, it's clear that transfers like Oscar, like Hook to Shanghai proves that a lot of money have been spent in these transfers. Do you think that in general this is the reality? There are overspending here in the market in, in, in Asia in general and in China in particular in which role the club licensing system and the governing body that deals with that in the AFC can, can help somehow. Daniel here mentioned what happens with the club licensing in UEFA, but I'm, I'm a testimony, I'm a witness that it, it worked and it works really well in the AFC also. I think if you compare UEFA and AFC with the rest of the confederations, they are by far the ones that works better. What can you tell us about that? Sure. Well, look, thank you for the compliment, but I certainly won't take credit for I have your, you have your colleagues here yeah, too, I know. For the that. licensing yeah. process in, in, in the AFC. I, 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 when I was there, I played a very small part in enforcing uh, the licensing process, just for the benefit of, of everybody that's here listening and, and watching elsewhere. When it comes to financial, uh, what we, financial criteria, what we call overdue payable, so this is money which is owed to players, to coaches, to the tax, social tax authorities, to clubs. Uh, there are certain deadlines that need to be met whereby if there is non-compliance with those deadlines, so if debts are fully paid or debts are mutually deferred or there is a dispute, Nick's taken, Nick's taken the club to, to CAS, uh, then the onus is on the national association in each territory of the AFC to not grant a license to that club to play in AFC competition. Now over the last sort of five years, there's been some cases where clubs, and, and very prominently in the last few years in, in Saudi Arabia, for example, where clubs which have qualified on sporting merit, clubs which have won cup competitions or finished second or third in, in their national leagues, have been denied licenses by their local uh, licensing authority, the, the Football Association, because they haven't uh, complied with, uh, haven't complied with those, uh, you know, payment deadlines. Going back to your, you know, your question of whether there is overspending. I mean, it's, it's a market at the end of the day, and you only pay as much as, or you only receive as much as what somebody is willing to pay. And as long as you comply with and fall within uh, the regulatory framework, so you ensure that your debts are met by a certain time frame, or you've made arrangements with your, your creditors to, to pay and you comply with those arrangements, then from a confederation perspective, in my personal view, from a confederation perspective, you, you tick the box. If, if you have a sophisticated football market whereby people are are willing to pay large amounts of money and they also comply with those payments, then the system works. But obviously on the other side you've got other issues that come to insolvency, bankruptcy, whatever else, and those are things which need to be dealt with on another side. One last point with respect to that question is when you look at transfer fees within Asia, and, and especially now in the last eight months since I've been outside of AFC, 
it really is only three or four markets where they can actually afford to pay transfer fees, let alone the amounts you're talking about for big transfers, which is realistically just China and one or two markets in, 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 in the Middle East. The, when you go back to the FIFA TMS data of international transfers, the significantly vast majority of all transfers in Asia are, are on a free transfer basis. Mm -hmm. So that's something else which, you know, when you're talking about the sophistication of those markets, it's something which maybe the Confederation hasn't really focused upon because it's only a small percentage of its markets which actually are, you know, paying seven-figure transfer fees for four players or maybe just one club in one market. So it, it's it's very different experience to what you'd see in Europe and South America. Uh, where there is there is a lot of money flowing mm. with respect to player registrations, and so the confederation attempts to regulate that or manage that through the licensing process and ensure that debts are paid. Thanks for the compliment in regards to South America, comparing the, the transfer fees with Europe. But I know I understand what you mean. There are transfer fees that are significant, but significantly lower than what you see in Europe in general. Mm. But. Mark, one question. Uh, in regards to the, 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 federa the association, um, besides the impact, the negative impact that the club itself has when it's relegated or lost, lo lost of points or everything, how, how does it impact negatively to the competition or to the federation in case of uh, such of the sanctions are applied? Sure. So uh, we have a live a life case at the moment uh, where uh, one of our clubs has uh, outstanding payments to a player and uh, CAS ruled in favor of the player so, and uh, the club still hasn't paid that particular player. Um, so we've now been asked by FIFA to initiate uh, dock points and then subsequently if the amount of money isn't paid then to relegate that particular club. So that creates a lot of implications for us. Clearly there's a reputational side of things. Um, Secondly, it puts us into conflict with the club, and obviously we, we have no choice but to implement these sanctions, and obviously you know, they are the right sanctions, um, but it puts us into conflict with the club. We, all, we always, as most uh, associations, have a kind of a bit of a love-hate relationship with our clubs anyway, so, um, so that doesn't help. Um, but also, in this particular case, this, this club is lying second in our league with a couple of matches to go. Um, if, if we dock points, then it'll drop down to third or fourth, which means that that club won't qualify for the AFC competitions next year. And that's important to us because we want our best clubs to be participating in that competition. If the best clubs don't participate, then it affects our future eligibility to, to play. So it's a real issue for us. And uh, obviously, we're doing everything we can to persuade the club to make good that payment. And uh, I, I'm pretty sure they will because they're not going to want to get relegated in Hong Kong. Um, we have one professional league. If they get relegated, they become an amateur club. So there's a huge implication for the club as well. So I think the situation will be resolved, but it's certainly it's not somewhere we want to be in in the first place. And there's no way that the federation or the association can somehow financially help this club? That's out of the... Um, well, I, firstly, I don't think we should. And uh, secondly, in this case, I don't think it's um, a lack of money that the club isn't uh, paying this particular player. They don't want to pay the player. Okay. I think um, if you go back a few years before the governance of um, football in Hong Kong improved, um, maybe the club would have got away with the situation. Mm. And it's only the fact that we now have more stringent governance reg regulations. The club licenses uh, come in and a club to participate in our league needs a club license. Uh, they can't get a club license if they have outstanding payments. Um, so um, no, we're not going to help the, the club, uh, we're going to encourage them to, to make good the commitment they made to the player and, yeah. and to fulfill the, the judgment of CAS and the uh, requirements of FIFA. Okay. James, just to complement this part of the discussion, uh, when we're speaking about a club that takes part in a continental competition, it's easier, inclusive for foreign creditors like a South American club or a foreign player, to, to make a kind of claim to the, the, uh, to the licensing uh, controlling body and then have this advantage sometimes it's much faster even than to go to FIFA with a claim. We realize that it happens a lot but when it comes to a club that doesn't participate in a continental cup you depend on the licensing system within a national level. Do you have by heart for instance an idea of which countries have already developed and applied actually like Hong Kong seems to be doing in within a national level? Or is far from this reality being? 
it's, it's a mix. Uh, I'd say it's, it's far from the reality. A lot of, a lot of uh, member associations in, in AFC will implement a, an AFC licensing process, whether for the AFC Champions League, which is the top competition, or the mm -hmm. AFC Cup, which is the second tier competition, uh, for their clubs to meet to participate in, in AFC competitions. There is work, and our development guys are here from AFC, uh, there is work to implement domestic licensing regulations across many of the, the AFC uh, member associations, but they'll be able to tell you better than me because they, they work at the coalface every day. There are obviously challenges. There's resistance mm -hmm. to implementing licensing regulations uh, locally. And of course, like all regulations that we have in sport, there comes the question of actual enforcement. Yeah. So what happens when you implement a domestic licensing system in, in a country in South Asia, but the team that's won the league for the last four years uh, doesn't meet the stadium requirements, for example. Do you, do you not grant them the license and, and put them back into the second division, which might be in Hong Kong, or very similar to Hong Kong, might be amateur or might not even exist? You know, so there's, um, there's, there's challenges. It's certainly not as sophisticated as, uh, as, as UEFA is, but I would still encourage any, any, any foreign clubs, players, agents, officials that have uh, judgments of FIFA or even just outstanding uh, payables which are owed to them by Asian clubs uh, to at a first instance when they are sending letters of demand or, or seeking enforcement of those cases to copy the AFC into, okay. uh, into, their, um, into their correspondence because the AFC does tabulate all of the, all of the cases that come in and, and you know, they, they have ways to put pressure on, on the associations to, to push their clubs to enforce. Okay. Uh, you know, those judgments. Nick, coming back to the transfer agreements and employment agreements, which kind of challenges or controversial points, can you, can you add something on that? Yeah, I, I think there's four key areas that, that I've come across more and more recently, um, particularly in England, where obviously we, we've got, a, we spend more on transfers in England than just about the rest of Europe put together. And, the top five in Europe spend more than the rest of the world put together. So there, there's a lot of money in the English transfer market, but there are, as a result, even more disputes. And the, most of the disputes are the first one we've just discussed, the player's salary. That's perhaps an obvious one, the ability to pay that. But some others that perhaps are not so obvious, disputes about agents, intermediaries, it's an increasing area. There are probably more disputes in England in football arbitration about that than any other issue at the moment. There are dozens of disputes because clubs and players make various agreements with agents to pay percentages on a transfer and agents accuse each other of inducing a breach of contract, of taking the client away uh, or a party doesn't want to pay the agent's fee and says the agent hasn't performed the services or there's a dispute that the agent's actually been secretly working on one side or for himself and not in the interest of the player or the club. Those types of disputes are very common and can be very costly. Um, the third area is uh, image rights, image rights agreements, and that certainly came up in a, in a cast case I was involved in involving a Chinese club um, where there's been a tendency to try and pay the salary through image rights agreements. And certainly in England and increasingly elsewhere, the tax authorities come down very strongly on that if it's fraudulent. So you have to be very careful structuring the agreements with things like that. And then the fourth area that I've seen a growth in recently is, is sell-on clauses. They're very important for particularly lower league clubs. It's a case I'm involved in at the moment where a player went from team A to B for half a million pounds sell on clause team a gets 25 percent when team b sells on team b sells on for four million pounds they get their one million but team b gets a sell on from team c and team c then sells the player for 15 million pounds and team a says we want 25 percent of the 20 percent you get and nobody has thought about this and the, the clause just says sell on fee is a sell on fee the immediate or is it future and there's in fact two cases I'm involved in now just about that issue so it's those types of issues in transfer agreements that you need to be careful because there are increasing number of disputes both domestically and internationally uh, arising as a result of not thinking about what might happen Daniel um, 
when you dealt with the transfer of hook, for instance, if you, if you may say something about that specifically, what, what did you face in terms of bringing a player that used to play in, in the West, let's say like that, to another culture with other ideas, with other perspectives? What, what do you think, uh, not only in terms of the agreement itself, technically speaking, but the reality, the impact uh, in regards to the player's expectation and and legally in, in legal controversies that you might face well it, it, it was actually a smooth and, and quick uh, negotiation about the main terms but then when it came to, to draft the contract it took a lot more time than I, I thought to but it's it's different it's a different culture and we have to understand it and uh, there were clauses that uh, Normally, we don't pay much attention to, to them in, in the Western, like in Europe. Uh, for instance, it's, it's, if a player gets uh, sick uh, from whatever disease for more than uh, two weeks, then he can be terminated the contract. We are not used to such clauses, but, well, it, it can be negotiated at the end. Uh, we, we reached a reasonable um, uh, solution. And in clauses concerning, you know, cultural, like uh, learning a little bit about the Chinese customs and, and paying a lot of attention to the disciplinary uh, um, regulations and respecting the AFC and the, and the Super League rules were very important for them. And that's fine. I mean, we're also used to, to comply with those rules, but there was a special attention to those um, disciplinary rules, which didn't cause so much of a problem as, as the first example I mentioned. Um, yeah, uh, so basically, uh, according to, to, to salaries, uh, thank God, no, no, no bad experiences. Uh, everything is, is compliance uh, by the club, is, is fine. We never had a problem, and, and we, f we feel that the club is, is really uh, has a great interest that the player gives a good image of the club and, and, uh, and complies also in the field with, with the referee's decision. Which, which is fine. It's a cultural thing, and, and we, we, we agree with it, so it's a matter of, uh, of complying with that, and, and we'll be fine. Nick Dott already touched the, the issue of intermediaries, which is a bomb that already explodes. The problems with the deregulation or the uh, not efficient regulation of FIFA, the last one, it might change in the near future. We hope and we think about that. But James, you were on the other side in the governing body. Now you are as a practitioner with your law office. Is there any blind spot that now you can see better? I mean, some, some, some things that you can see, watch by another perspective uh, on the side of the clubs or agents themselves uh, that you think that could be dealt prop more properly by the confederations or the regulating bodies in you can add any other, you can bring any other controversial point in regards to intermediaries if you, not all of them, because then we could spend like two days. Wait, <laughs> how long do you have? No. <laughs> Depends on your colleagues. You can. Uh, uh, look, uh, working with the governing body of, of Asian football, um, I don't mind saying this, that we were going through a process before I left where we were looking at the flaws in the deregulation of intermediaries uh, by FIFA. We'd had a number of complaints from our associations uh, as to what had effectively become a jungle or a wild west, where before it was much more controlled. Yes, there were bad eggs. There's always a, a bad egg, I guess, in every bunch. Uh, but they could regulate, they had the tests, and they could sanction clubs, intermediaries, players, etc., who were using unregistered intermediaries or who were engaging in conduct which we don't want to see in football. Now on the outside, especially doing the vast majority of my work in the Asia and the Asia Pacific region, uh, I don't know how you can describe a wild west or a jungle in, in a much stronger way, but it's, it's, it's crazy. Crazy is just the easiest way to say it. Uh, there, is, there is zero enforcement. Uh, there is zero enforcement across, uh, across the Asia Pacific when it comes to, to intermediaries and there's agents. There's a lot of money which is leaving football, uh, which, which should be staying within football uh, and the biggest problem we have is understanding the nature of the relationship between the intermediary player or the intermediary in the club or the intermediary in the, and the official 
but also how to resolve those disputes. Uh, you know, we have a lot of cases of international related disputes where they don't know how to protect themselves, both players, clubs, agents, coaches, etc. And, and the, one, the one thing that I do when I, I work with intermediaries and, and I assist them in drafting their representation contracts or I, I'm helping clubs with their issues with intermediaries is make sure that they have something which is very clear, something which is very structured, but something which also points to a proper international arbitration forum for them to allow them to, to resolve their disputes. I mean, it gets more work for, for, for people like Nick, but the reality is, is, is without, those, without, those, without those structures in place from a, a contractual perspective, you're going to continue to have these, these cases, you know, this, this jungle, yeah. this wild west where, where clubs effectively, they don't know who they're paying or what they're paying or, or, or players are owed this or that or, or whatever else. And there's no structure to the process. And you can't say that that's a good thing. You can't say that that's a good thing. Yeah. And uh, from what I understand, speaking with many friends who are, who are agents and friends who are working in, in European football and, and people who work at FIFA, that in the next two weeks there is going to be, uh, they have a transfer, what they call a transfer market task force. Mm. A lot of leading agents globally have been invited to come to FIFA House yeah. and have been invited to provide their views on what I guess Gianni Infantino calls the re-regulation of the intermediary industry and discuss various things, not just whether they should get 3%, 5%, 10%, mm -hmm. but all of these things we've talked about, having robust structures in place, dispute resolution systems, mandatory contractual clauses, and keeping the money within football. I think the experiment now, it's, it's just gone three years. 1st of April, 2015, deregulation. We're now at 17 April, 18 April, you know, 2018. It's just past three years now. And at least in the international space, we can see that deregulation has for lack of a better word, failed. Yeah. And it's made the situation worse than it was before. So um, it wouldn't surprise me that in the next six months, FIFA's obviously made very big changes now to the RSTP, the regulations on the status and transfer of players, which are coming into force on the 1st of June. It wouldn't surprise me if you see the regulations governing, uh, uh, regulations and working with intermediaries, if, there are, if they're even repealed and we have new regulations or they're substantially amended, um, to fix these problems we see in the market. And what I'm talking about in Southeast Asia is just a very small, a very small part of, uh, of yeah, the market. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure to confine the jurisdiction to national bodies is very uncomfortable for any foreign agent, that's for sure. And that's what the system offers you mm. today. But on the other hand, being a foreign, foreign agent can have some advantages. Daniel, we were discussing the cases, I think, in Portugal and in Brazil where an intermediary cannot represent a minor between 16 and 18, while some countries allow that, which means that if someone gets a plane and go to Portugal and go to, to Brazil with a license or registered in another country that allows him, he can, he can represent a Brazilian minor or he can represent a Portuguese minor, while the national agent cannot do that. This is another something that is entirely... Can you, I think you can add something to that. Uh, yeah, that, that's a problem. Uh, it's a lot of di discrepancy uh, between the national regulations because FIFA has set up uh, a set of principles that should be respected, but it gives a lot of freedom to the national associations to, to go beyond these this, uh, basic principles. And what we see now is quite of a jungle. So in some countries you have to do a test, in other countries you have to pay to pay a certain amounts yearly to be registered as an agent and then um, you know it's it's difficult in some countries you can't can't even be an agent if you are not a national of that country so it's when you're doing an international transaction and football is international always uh, then you want to get paid to be a broker on a deal and then you find yourself stuck in a position that some, sometimes you may have to to partner with a national uh, agent in, in order to receive your money or, or to be registered and you have to go through a series of bureaucracy uh, formalities and uh, it's, it's really um, sometimes difficult to understand this kind of when it gets to intermediaries or so-called agents there's always um, many different understandings I mean uh, one of the problems, as you mentioned, is this one. You can find uh, Spanish agents coming to Portugal to sign with 15 or 16 year old youngsters and of course they build a relationship that a Portuguese agent is not allowed to mm -hmm. 
or he has to, to, to recur to other uh, legal instruments, uh, not, not particular um, the normal inter intermediary agreements, but other civil, like uh, civil ins uh, legal civil instruments, to have a kind of a relationship with that players. Otherwise, you get in a, in a situation where you'll, you lose to, to your uh, foreign competitors. No. A recent case was, for instance, also, but a slightly different approach, um, aspect of this, this relationship is FIFA forbids uh, if you represent a minor, to, if, if you're being remunerated until he's 18 years old, there was a uh, last summer transfer window, uh, a German club agreed with a Portuguese club to a transfer of a, a minor of 16 year old for 20 million euros. And at the end, what was, came publicly out was that uh, it didn't went through because the agent couldn't be paid by the German club because the, 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 the rules forbid it. And the, the Germans, maybe rightly so, were not uh, uh, committed to, to circumvent this rule or to make a promise to pay this agent when, when the player turned out to be 18 years old. So, um, unfortunate, unfortunately for, for the player, he, he didn't have a chance to move to, to, this, to this club. But there, you know, there are a million uh, reasons and, and controversies surrounding uh, intermediaries. And I agree with, with many things that was said here before, but you know, sometimes there are some, some practices that also are not really understandable. The, 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 the previous system of licensing of FIFA uh, about the tests was also not, not particularly uh, well um, done and, and had a basis with reality. Uh, you know, what, what an agent does and he should comply is I think with the ethical part, with the deontological part of their profession. Uh, you, don't need, you don't need an agent to know uh, really well about the solidarity mechanism or the training compensation or other aspects of the, of the legal regulations. You can hire a lawyer to do that for you. So as long as you, as you know your limits and sometimes you are allowed, sometimes you are not allowed to be representing both parties in a negotiation and as long as you respect uh, these uh, ethic, uh, ethic uh, aspects of the negotiation, mm -hmm. then I think it's fine. You don't need to, to really go through an extensive examination to be an agency. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, it's a mixed feelings about, the, about this. Mark, under the association's perspective, which are the most problemat problematic topics and how do you tackle them in regards to intermediaries, if any? Um, in, in Hong Kong, the, um, the football landscape is pretty uh, unsophisticated, so we don't have uh, a huge problem with intermediaries at the moment. Um, I think it, as the professionalism of the league becomes more, we, we're going to end up with, with more and more issues like that. Um, to be honest, the biggest issue we're facing in the league at the moment is the question of match fixing. So I'm going to just talk about that for a little bit. Um, and I might go on a rant because I feel very strongly about this. I think it's uh, an insidious cancer which is affecting the lifeblood of the sport. And in, in this region generally, and Hong Kong specifically, we're quite vulnerable to that. We've had a lot of cases where um, players have been fixing games and uh, have been identified as that. We've had examples of players um, being convicted, which means they, they lose their livelihood, they lose their reputation. In some cases, they lose their freedom because they're given custodial sentences. The reason I say it's an ins insidious and it's threatening um, football is that it's a vicious circle. So if people don't want to go and watch games that have been fixed and the outcome is predetermined, and if people stop going to watch the games, it affects the gate receipts, the club's income, the attractiveness of the game to sponsors. With, with less money in there, you can attract uh, poorer quality players, and eventually it just kind of goes downhill. Um, so we have to do something about it. So the, the FA, we um, employ Sport Radar. They monitor every single game in our Premier League, our reserve division, and our first division, and we get a weekly report on those games that have been fixed. Um, we have a significant percentage of games being fixed at the moment. Um, even though our players sign a, um, a, a code of conduct and we have compulsory briefings at the start of every season where we explain what the risks are of, of match fixing, how they are going to be approached, 
how to avoid it, and what the consequences are. This year, for example, it, we, we had the compulsory briefing. The week later, one week later, we had a report from Sport Radar saying that one of the games has been fixed. Um, the big problem for us is that we get a lot of money from the, from the government, from uh, a charity, such as the Jockey Club, and from commercial partners. None of those bodies want to be associated with a sport that's tarnished. So it's, if it affects our reputation, it affects our funding, that then affects our ability to, do, to spend money on things that we should be spending money on as an association, such as grassroots development, women's football, referee development, coach education, and so on. So s collectively, somehow, we have to try and tackle this, uh, this, this problem. Um, it's not going to go away. And actually, it's probably getting worse linked to the, uh, the question of football betting. 70% of uh, betting on football in the whole world is in Asia. Asia is the, the, the home, and it's part of the culture. And uh, actually, we, we probably need to do something about it. In, in Hong Kong, it's illegal to bet on Hong Kong football, but we know that there's a massive unregulated market, and that makes the situation worse. So we want to try and open a dialogue with the, with the government now on legalizing football betting, which, and then establishing a fund to help us to combat the problem of match fixing. James, your thoughts on that? What's your match fixing in general? Or yeah, or match fixing and betting in general. Well, look, uh, yeah, I mean, related more or less. Yeah, look, look. In my former role at the the Confederation, match fixing was one of the areas that I did do a lot of work in, and, and you know, the AFC has, to its credit, uh, done a lot of work across its member associations, working on educating them of the, what we call the dangers of match fixing, I guess, but also collaborating with them to, uh, to basically take that next step and, and, and we'd say prosecute uh, players, coaches, officials, clubs that are, are engaging in, in match manipulation. Uh, for, those that, for those that were here this morning on the topic of, uh, uh, of integrity, where we had La Liga and we had uh, Jake Marsh here from Perform, uh, you know, the, w there was talk about, uh, especially from Jake, about that next step. And that's really where the, the problem lies now in, in the market uh, when it comes to match fixing. Everything Mark said is absolutely true. Uh, if you don't deal with the issue of manipulation of your, your competitions, then everything on the commercial side of your business disappears. Because when your competitions are not legitimate, people go there because at the end of the day, 11 versus 11 are playing against each other. And at the start of that match, anything is possible. One team might be much stronger than the other on paper, but the result is unknown. When that result is, is contrived, uh, you know, the value in that match itself is lost. Now, the problem, the problem that we have right now in the market uh, with a lot of the sports betting operators, you know, I won't mention the names of the companies, but including the one uh, that, that works with the Hong Kong Football Association, is what they do is they gather the data, they look at their algorithms, look at the, the betting markets, and they, they put together their reports and they say, all right, this number of matches in your competitions are potentially compromised. Football Association, here you go. Here's the data. The problem is then, what does the Football Association do with that data? Associations like Hong Kong are, are professional. They have integrity. They deal with that data. They report that to the police. They have the resources to maybe do something internally. You have a significant number of football associations globally that either they don't know what to do, they're themselves compromised, or they can't go to their local authorities because their local authorities themselves are compromised. And so what's really lacking in this space now when it comes to preventing manipulation of matches in, mm. in football is taking that next step. Is, yes, okay, we are company X. We've, we've discovered that there's 15 matches in, in this competition where one club has been involved in potentially manipulating the match. It's then the next step, the proper investigation, the enforcement through the sport disciplinary ethics bodies, uh, and, and the necessary sanctions which are required to deter fixing. That doesn't exist right now. Really, it's only, it's only at the point where we know this is happening, but our associations are not sophisticated enough to take that next step. So if I was going to talk about the biggest problem in relation to fixing, it's actually, you know, we can actually look at data now, and if we accept that it's valid, we can actually yeah. confidently say, okay, this club was involved in in 30 matches here, 28 have been flagged. These, it's a bit like blood doping. No other possible conclusion can be drawn from this data except mm. for that the result was contrived. Fine, we know that, but what are we doing about it? You know, we know that data and we need to build the tools 
through, maybe the AFC assisting its associations or even the associations or UEFA or whoever else it might be. We need to build the tools for those associations to actually go out there and deal with those issues, whether it's, like I said, working with their local authorities or doing it internally. Right now that doesn't exist and that's the problem we have because we know what's going on or we can certainly know to a certain degree of confidence what's going on, but what's actually happening? And for me, that's the biggest issue right now. Yeah. Nick, without implying and even less affirming that, you can infer from the fact that many clubs from the Premier League are being sponsored by, by, by betting companies would jeopardize the uncertainty of the result. Is that an issue already in the English football? Is being tackled already? Is, is something that concerns to the authorities? Again, without implying that, this would lead to match fixing, but still, is it something comfortable to, to live with in football? Well, we, we raised it in, um, I acted for Joey Barton, who got banned for 18 months originally for betting on football, and we reduced that to 13 months in appeal. And he made the point very strongly that he is paid every week to wear a shirt, encouraging the fans to bet on football. But if he bets on football, he can be banned from playing football. And in what other realm of life could that work? Could, can you imagine a, a marathon runner wearing a T-shirt encouraging fans to take performance-enhancing drugs? It just doesn't make sense because the, the pendulum in some ways has swung the other way too far in England. Um, and the approach that the regulators has, has taken uh, at, from FIFA down to the FA is to have a very strict ban on players betting on football at all. And so when Joey Barton was banned, it, there was no question of integrity issue at all. The prosecution said, there's no integrity here, there's no match-fixing charges, mm -hmm. but they imposed what was effectively at his age a career-ending ban on a Premier League player because of the number of bets he'd placed. Now, that contradiction cannot last, in, in my view. The Premier League now, over half the Premier League club's main sponsor is a football betting company. If you watch a Premier League game in England, you're bombarded with adverts telling you to bet on that game in the middle of the game and apps on your phone that allow you to do it. And yet there are these very strict rules against the players placing, even if he's a player playing in England, placing a bet on an Australian team where he's got no connection at all. It doesn't make sense. And it seems to me there is a solution that would also deal with the issues that Mark and James has said. Uh, football clubs, have, you know, they've said this to me, some Premier clubs have said to me, they don't want to have uh, betting companies on their shirts because they know the problems that gambling can cause are social problems, but the betting companies will pay twice as much as any other sponsor because they earn so much money from football betting. So the solution surely is have properly regulated, and I agree, legalized gambling in football, but tax the betting companies substantial amounts on their profits that they're making from betting on football and use those funds to set up something like WADA, the World Anti-Doping Authority, for corruption that can then look into corruption in, in football, can police it, can enforce it. You'll have far greater funds than governments can provide if you tax the betting operators from the profits they're making from it. And you could also use some of those funds to help with the social problems caused by gambling instead of what's been happening in England, punishing the players for betting, which doesn't help anybody. Yeah. And your thoughts about Portugal, how Portugal did tackle the Federated Association, did uh, an experience in the past in regards to control, try to control or to attack the match fixing? Uh, I think, I think uh, not really. I mean, we have had some problems with match fixing, and as James explained it very well about monitoring and flagging, uh, it's easy to do it. You can see what happens with the kind of uh, amounts, the, the, the amounts of betting that is done in the matches. Regarding Portugal, we see it in the lower leagues. They are a little bit out of scope. Of, of the media, so you don't talk about much that, that games, those games. But but we have had some examples of it, and I think if you're able and you you're able to do to control the bettings and to see which player, which games were potentially 
objects of of um, of corruption uh, from the players uh, and then you have the problem you you hand it out to the football associations but what can they do they don't have any investigatory competencies so basically they have to, you have to create like a task force with the police and i don't know if the police has has their hands full maybe they should be they should have more power and they should uh, given means to to work together with the football associations so what use do you have if you get the reports from the games that were potentially object of, of corruption by the players and then you can't do anything about it you can't wire the players and you can't investigate it as well as as it was pointed out here by my colleague it's uh, you have to to have rules that make sense and and just prohibiting players from 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 making any bets doesn't resolve anything at all so mm. uh, there has to be a will from all stakeholders to to tackle this in an effective manner and that seems to be the thing that is missing here portugal is a small country of course some some clubs of the lower leagues have been object of ownership of asian asian owners and you can feel that uh, these were the clubs that were being monitored and targeted and flagged mm. uh, during the matches that, uh, that that are object of huge, huge betting. Yeah. Okay, difficult. Uh, our last round, I'll begin with Mark. Everybody's free to speak about whatever they want, but not you, because we agreed before that I will give you the floor just to speak a little bit about the transformation strategic plan from the, for the HKFA, if you can... Mm. Well, I'd like to just talk about um, the, the governance aspect of our strategic plan, as yeah. that's the theme of this uh, topic. Um, and for me, good governance is, is actually fairly fundamental and, and um, common sense. It's just about openness and transparency. It starts with the constitution itself, and making sure that that is written in such a way that um, no individuals can use, utilize it to benefit themselves personally, as opposed to... Um, being representative of the sport as a whole. So there are very good examples and, um, of, of model constitutions and uh, make sure that it reflects the statutes of both the Confederation of the AFC and FIFA. So it starts with the, with the documentation. But as we all know, um, words on a piece of paper are meaningless unless they're implemented effectively. So then it's about getting the right um, systems and structures in place, the right people, um, the right um, tools to evaluate whether the constitution is being implemented effectively or not. So that means having some checks and balances, some external audit uh, of, the, of the process. So in Hong Kong, we, um, we changed the constitution. We changed the, um, the, the terms that the directors could uh, serve. We changed the balance on the board between uh, directors who were linked directly to clubs and those that weren't, because previously there was a majority of club-related directors on the board, which meant that a lot of the resources and um, decisions were going in favor of the clubs rather than the wider development. So to make sure the representation of football and all of the stakeholders is on the board, not just the board, but the membership as well, because again, historically, the membership of the Hong Kong FA was entirely clubs. Mm -hmm. Now we've opened it up to any organization that has football development at its heart uh, and an interest in football. So that means some of the universities, some of the other amateur leagues, etc., are now um, associate members of the Hong Kong FA. So we tried to broaden the representation. We tried to, to clarify everybody's roles and responsibilities. And um, we tried to enshrine that in, a, in, a, in a, a new set of governing documents that we now kind of work through and try and implement. So um, it's relatively early days in that process. But all of those things have been putting in place. And I, and I think it's apparent to a lot of people that um, the benefits are already coming to fruition. I wonder how it would work in, in other associations try to bring other stakeholders, not only clubs, that would be a, a huge clash to be seen. Can I well, it's not, it wasn't an easy process. Yeah, in, in England, we have a phrase that uh, yeah. turkeys don't vote for Christmas. Yeah. And, and, and I think that's <laughs> when you're trying to change an organization from yeah. the inside, that's the challenge that you have to make, yeah. sh to try and demonstrate that the greater good of the sport is actually more important than the personal yeah. conflicts of interest or vested interest that might be there. You're right. James, you're final commentaries or thoughts? Well, look, I would, I would just mirror what, what Mark said when it comes to governance. I think, you know, the Hong Kong FA is, is, is a bit of a model for how, uh, you know, you go through a process and you reform everything uh, on paper. 
but at the end of the day, it's about an implementation and enforcement of what you actually, the good rules that you have, which allow for, for good governance and success to occur. And look, I've always been of the view, and, and I use a sporting analogy, but uh, you can apply this really to all types of business, but I've always been of the view, if you get your off the field right, then your on the field success is natural. But if you're on the field, you have the best 11 players in the world playing for your team, if off the field you've got drama, boardroom issues, whatever, that's inevitably going to affect your on-field performance and, and things are going to drop off. Uh, look, I take that comment you said about stakeholders. I'm going to make a bold prediction here, but I'm also firmly of the view after having worked in the Confederation for a long time, I, I might be qualified to say this, but I think that we're moving now in a direction where the traditional pyramid model of sport is dead or is, 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 is dying. Um, you know, you just have to look at some of the successful uh, national leagues which work in conjunction with their clubs and their clubs associations and their players associations and other stakeholder groups, what we call non-traditional stakeholder groups, and you can see how they flourish and how they're successful. And, mm -hmm. and, and those sort of national federations that you have, uh, they exist to provide services, maybe a disciplinary body or the appointment of referees or liaison with FIFA for international transfer certificates. I mean, the Premier League in England is obviously the, the landmark example in football. I and mean, you go to other sports, NBA, basketball is very clear. I mean, how many people here even know that there is a US Basketball Federation? Yeah. I mean, they do two things. They mm -hmm. send teams to World Cups, they send teams to Olympics. That's it. Uh, you know, you have professional sport doesn't need the pyramid model. Professional sport in each territory can organize itself properly when those stakeholders get together, they discuss, they work as a team, players, coaches, clubs, maybe agents, uh, other groups, and they can generate commercial contracts, they can generate money, fan interest, etc., etc. It all flows. You don't need you know, an overarching association at, at the back of that. You, you might need them for certain things, for liaison with international markets or whatever else, but. But that, that's about it. So I, I, I see governance now, and, and FIFA's done this over the last few years very well in terms of engaging those non, what we'd call non-traditional stakeholders, World League Forum, European Club Association, FIFA Pro. Uh, you know, there's, there's a, an organization coming now for the International Coaching Association. Mm -hmm. They're obviously bringing agents in, like I've just spoken before about the Transfer Market Task Force. They're engaging those sort of non-traditional stakeholders, the, not the member associations, but the other actors who are actually the ones that generate the revenues in our sport and the reason yeah. why we watch the sport. Um, and I think that's certainly the way of the future and that's what we're going to be start seeing over the next you know, decade or so where the sports government model is going to not necessarily blow up but it's going to shift from being a sort of international federation, regional federation, national association and then the base of that pyramid where you're going to have those actors at the base of the pyramid. They're going to be the ones managing, running the competitions and being directly engaging with the FIFAs, the confederations, or whatever else. It's going to almost flip on itself. So, uh, anyway, bold prediction. Watch this space. I agree with you. And we, we have to add that the power that has been the empowerment of, of the supporters, which are becoming customers, so somehow it would impact also all the, all the, the way that the, the market behaves in some senses. Absolutely. My mistake. Yeah, I did leave supporters out. I mean, uh, you just have to look going back to my home country, but you look in Australia, for example, what FIFA's doing there now with, the, with the, the reworking of what we call the Congress or the AGM there, the stakeholder groups that FIFA met with in Australia included uh, representations of coaches, representation of second wow. division clubs, supporters, women's football, referees, uh, referees association. So all these groups which, uh, which have a vested interest in the good governance yeah. and running of football. So... Yeah, absolutely, 100%. Okay. Nick, your final yeah, words. I, I, I think um, universality is an important point because uh, football is obviously the biggest game in the world. It's a global game. The rules of football are the same in terms of the laws of the game throughout the world. It's, it's an international language, and you can have a Brazilian player play in China and a Slovakian player play in Australia, and it doesn't matter. The same is true when you look at governance increasingly and importantly. The, the fundamental principles of governance and also being a lawyer, I would say, of football law are the same all over the world. And it's become a distinct area 
and the biggest market for sports administration, governance, law that there is in any sport because football is the biggest sport. Um, so I, I think that's important because it means we can all work together and learn from each other despite being in, in different countries just as players and fans are able to. Um, there, there's a lot more detail I'd like to talk about, but rather than doing that, I'll just make a shameless plug for a book that fills this gap we're bringing out next month, the first comprehensive guide to football law, every aspect of it throughout the, throughout the world, although it's based in England. James is one of the authors. There's over 50 authors of the top lawyers uh, practicing in this area called Football and the Law, which covers every single one of these and many other areas. Um, so I'm sure all of you will be very interested in getting that. It's available from next month by Bloomsbury Publishers. <laughs> and it will save me talking anymore. You can, you can have your lunch when, instead. When, when we convinced Nick to be here, I told him that Socrax is a huge platform. <laughs> Daniel, your well, thoughts. Very quickly, if you analyze um, good governance in, in the football industry and its evolution, I think you quickly realize that the primary beneficiaries are the clubs and also the, the regulatory bodies that implement those rules. But there is an, as an important aspect, you know, the ones who have most respect and, and the implementation of the good governance rules in the clubs are the boards of directors. And normally the experience tells you that they make these rules for the others, not for themselves. And you see the same thing in the regulatory bodies, as you've seen for many years, FIFA and UEFA implementing those rules in the associations and making the associations implementing those rules in the clubs, but not at the top level, executive level of those governing bodies. So recent scandals made, made, made this, this um, controversy with FIFA and, and even UEFA um, deal with it. They were forced to deal with it and they were forced to deal with it not only by, as everybody is aware of, the FBI, but also about the main sponsors of the World Cup and of FIFA. So they had to make a huge reformation about their rules and it, it's really positive. And you realize that the primary beneficiaries, I repeat, are the ones who implement it. Just a, a very short example also regarding my club, FC Porto. I'm now two years out of the club. And you saw that in the last years they didn't comply with the financial fair play uh, regulations. And so UEFA, monitoring FC Porto over the last three years, uh, was aware that they ex they, they, the expenditure uh, exceeded the, the revenues. So they were forbidden for hiring new players. And you saw that in the last years, every year, Porto changed the whole team. They needed quickly to win the title again, and they bought a whole set of new players, and still they didn't achieve, uh, manage to be champions. What happens with this new coach that just got in this season, he was not allowed to hire any new players. So all the players that were on loan had to come back and it was with these players that were on loan, the so-called second or B players, that we had to make the season. And now there's four games left and Porto is first on the league. So <laughs> great, great for them. So sometimes you don't need to spend a lot of money to, to win. You have to have a, a professional management. And if this professional management follows good governance rules, then for sure the club will, will be healthy and will keep on uh, going for many years. That's my... Since we, are, we use a lot of time and abuse of your patience and kindness, uh, I, will, I will not open the floor for questions that I'm sure that any one of our, our guests here will be able to answer any question that you might address to them outside. And I would like to ask you some applause for our guests. Thank you.